Yeah, so um, hello everyone. Welcome to our talk, Counter-Strike Global Offsets, uh, our journey into exploiting the source engine. Today, we are going to talk about how we pawn CSGO clients with a malicious server. First off, a bit about our motivation. So Counter-Strike Global Offensive has a huge following with lots of players on Steam every month and a very lively esports community. Additionally, there has already been successful prior work, which in combination with the older source engine has lots of potential for some really juicy bugs. So we also started this work more than a year ago as a pandemic project while we were all at home. Additionally, there's also a public leak of the source code, which can be found on GitHub. That, is also, that was also super helpful. And uh, like we also played it extensively at some point in our lives, and we therefore thought it would be super cool if we could pawn it. We specifically focused on server-to-client vulnerabilities, as the server-side code was already thoroughly audited, and it seemed quite robust, especially during our testing. There are lots of community servers, and even during our testing, players joined our server at random, and we thought like this would be a very realistic attack scenario. So once we have pawned one client, we can also then send out um, more invites to the player's friends list and make them join our server and then pawn them as well, basically. To give you some background, we first need to cover the setup and some of the tooling that we sp like specifically built for this project. The client uses a so-called information concealment engine, which is a symmetric block cipher used for encryption. But they only perform a real key exchange on official servers, and on community servers, the, the key is always hard-coded, and it is tied to the version. And because they prefer to write their own networking protocol on top of UDP, for some speed improvements, apparently, the baseline networking code includes fragmentation layers and compression. On top of the adjusted UDP protocol, um, the main method of communication is via protobufs, where they exchange messages of various types, which are either bidirectional, only from client to server, or only from server to client. And um, here's a video of our networking proxy in action. On the left side, you can see a player like walking around, switching weapons, shooting. And on the right side, you can see a corresponding dump of the messages, of the protobuf messages in real time. And yeah, this was super nice for us, especially during testing. And yeah, it was super, super uh, nice. Um, the source engine was released way back in 2004 and is mostly written in C++. This already sounds very promising as security practices um, back in 2004 were quite different to modern, modern ones. So most prominently, a classic stack buffer overflow existed um, in the parsing of encryption parameters which has since been fixed, and Counter-Strike is also compiled without stack cookies. That makes exploiting these kinds of vulnerabilities rather easy, especially in the past. There are various lines of codes, code that do not seem to be actually used in a game. The whole architecture of the game is quite complex, and to us it was not immediately clear what code is responsible for what. We thought like this would be a really good target. And the developers also use lots of asserts, which they sometimes also use for balance checking. Fortunately for us, those asserts do not actually end up in release builds. That was also very nice. So lesson learned, don't use asserts for bounce checking, especially if they're not compiled into release builds. And now Simon will talk about our first bug, the info leak. Thank you, Carl. Um, so Let's talk about an interesting feature in CSGO uh, to give you some background information necessary to understand the info leak. Uh, a CSGO community server, which can be hosted by anyone, will typically rotate between a set of maps uh, chosen by the server owner. And oftentimes these maps are not shipped with CSGO by default because they've been created by community members. And they need to be downloaded from the Steam Workshop or from other sources. And this is a problem um, because every time the CSGO server changes the map, uh, all players that don't have the map download would be disconnected. And as you, ca as you can imagine, that could be quite frustrating for players. So the solution to this problem is to enable players or their clients to dynamically download maps at the beginning of each round. Uh, the way this works is that the server sends the client the HTTP URL uh, during the connection stage from which uh, to download files from. And then we actually discovered a path reversal bug um, in the download functionality, but it turned out to be a duplicate. And instead, we focused on um, uh, logic bugs, and we found an interesting parser differential that led to a powerful info leak. So with the next slides, we'll break down the high-level logic flow of the download functionality as implemented on Linux. 
Um, as CSGO also works on Linux, we preferred working uh, on that OS because we are personally more familiar with it than Windows. And I will come back as to why that is important in a couple of slides. At the beginning of each match, uh, the server sends the client a list of files that are required to play the next, uh, to play the next match. Uh, this can be sounds, skins, maps, and so on. Um, the client then simply concatenates the missing file name with the HTTP URL uh, they received during the connection stage. And then this download is implemented using libcurl, at least on Linux. So let's look at some reverse code and interesting behavior. Uh, when CSGO set up the curl request, it registered a callback that is used for each header in the HTTP response. So this is the uh, curl, opt, uh, curl header callback variable we see in a snippet above. And then it also registers a curled write callback, which is called when the HTTP body is received. So looking at the code of the curl header callback, uh, we can see that a case-sensitive compare is made against the header name. And if this header name equals content length, uh, a branch is entered. And we'll discuss what happens inside of this quite special branch inside the next uh, slides. So. We have just seen how the content length header is processed by the CSGO client, and the value is used by CSGO to allocate a buffer large enough to fit the HTTP response body, which is the missing file. Um, and this buffer is then written to disk with the desired file name. So now for the parser differential. On Linux, the CSGO client parses the header case sensitive, but the underlying library, which is still curl, case insensitive. This naturally leads to a confusion between the two. If we now tell the CSGO client to create a large buffer on the heap, then send an empty body, it will happily write uninitialized memory to disk because the call write callback has never actually been called and nothing has ever been written to this buffer. So to illustrate this point a bit more, here's an example HTTP response sent by a malicious server. So as you can see, uh, there are two content length response headers. Um, the first time it occurs, it uses capital letters and has the value 1337. Um, the second time it occurs, it occurs with lowercase letter and has the value zero. And CSGO recognizes only the first header um, because they did the case sensitive search and would allocate a buffer of size 1337. Uh, curl, on the other hand, expects an empty body and finishes the request uh, without returning an error because it uses zero bytes and expects zero bytes. Um, CSGO then proceeds to write the buffer to disk. Um, which means the curl write callback has never been called before, and thus the file contains uninitialized memory. So now to Windows, and as a spoiler, in Windows an entirely different HTTP uh, client was used, but the same proof of concept still worked without ever needed, needing to be modified. Um, so on Windows, instead of curl, they used the built-in Windows Internet API. Uh, Internet Open is used to create a client resource, and Internet Open URL is then used to specifically return an HTTP client resource. This resource is then used to make the HTTP request. Cisco made the mistake of relying on the HTTP uh, content length header value to allocate a buffer instead of uh, the number of bytes read returned by Internet Read File, which is the actual size of the body. So there is a mismatch here. They did not compare the content length header value with the actual number of bytes read. This means the bug still works in Windows and allowed us to exploit Windows clients as well, which is where realistically most CSGO players uh, will play on. So in order to break ASLR, we can now spray the heap with objects that contain function pointers and then deallocate them. And luckily, the CSGO process did not clear allocated memory um, when it was allocated or freed. This means that the buffers that were previously allocated were written to disk, and if they were written to disk, they would contain uninitialized memory. Keep in mind that we now have files containing uninitialized memory somewhere on the player's uh, disk system, uh, including pointers. Um, and this meant we had to find a week to leak the contents from these files to the servers. And at first we thought, okay, probably we'll have to come up with some really annoying side channel leak or somehow figure it out, maybe brute force a hash. But uh, this turned out to be very easy because funny enough, the CSGO server can ask the client to upload files from their CSGO directory to the server. And we guessed that the specific request was introduced to allow the server to verify some files. But instead of sending, uploading a hash, they just upload the entire file. Um, and this made it very easy for us to search the file for some pointers uh, and then break ASLR. 
And this info leak turned out to be 100% reliable. Uh, it worked more than 9 out of 10 times when we tested. And it doesn't corrupt the client's memory. Uh, so you can just retry it an infinite amount of times, um, which allowed us to break ASR effectively and very reliably. Um, that allowed us to corrupt some memory. And this is what Niklas will talk about next. Yes, thank you, Simon, for arguably the most, impart most important part of our chain. And obviously, we also need a way to find uh, or get execution control. And while we tried the following on both the uh, server and the client, we noticed that the server side actually seemed pretty robust to our approach, and we didn't find any bug on the server side, which wasn't fixed already since the source leak came out. So as Carl talked about previously, to get a feel of the networking attack surface, uh, we utilized our networking proxy and started to just modify and play around the values a bit and injected some packets, so on. And this showed already promising results as we are able to find quite a few issues already. But sadly, uh, the majority of those bugs were simple null binder DRFs or crashes on the client. And those obviously are not of our interest as we wanted to find some remote code executions. Uh, however, we found some of them after filtering uh, out like our crashes and found some exploitable bugs. Additionally, as ta uh, Carl talked also previously, we used the knowledge that asserts were not compiled into the release build and specifically grabbed and f tried to find cases where asserts were used as a bounce check, as a security boundary, boundary and this also netted us quite some, uh, quite some bugs. Okay. So the first bug I'm going to show you today is an out-of-bounds access in the source engine entity list handler. And games usually have like an ent entity component system, also called ECS, to manage game entities. Players, props, weapons, in case of CSGO. And this part of the source engine proved to be very vulnerable to these types of attack. You can see on the top the protobuf message, and on the bottom the corresponding handler to that protobuf message. And as you can see, the server, or in our case, the malicious attacker, had completely control over the entity index, and this was just passed around to the get end method on the client entity list. So to traverse the call chain to the root cause, we start in the protobuf handler I just showed you. Next up, we end up in the get entity method, which passes the index to get base entity. And this is a very important method, this, as this method also gets us execution control in the second line, thanks to the out-of-bounds virtual call you can see on the second line. And we further traverse our index to get listed entity. And this just passes the index, in the index to lookup entity by network index, <laughs> which is the final method of the chain and also the root cause for this bug. As you can see, the first checks if the index is smaller than null, and else would immediately use it to access the entity array. Notice there are certs behind the red arrows, probably standing a bit in front of it, um, which would have prevented this bug in the first place if it were actually compiled into the binary. So that's quite funny. And the smaller than, like the first check is also pretty useless as a security boundary as the, the size of the type of the array is bigger than one. So we could, with a theoretically large index, also uh, out of bounds in front of the array. And thanks to the nature of the source engine, this is actually a pre-allocated fixed size array, so we are inside the data section, which is important for our expert strategy. So the next issue I want to show you today is uh, inside, uh, is another out of bounds access in uh, data array, and this time in the game split screen feature. So source is actually able to have a two-player, multiplayer split-screen session, which can be requested by the client, and the bug is then triggered by the split-screen control message sent back by the server. And you can see the protobuf message on the left-hand side. And the bug is triggered, uh, sorry, and this acknowledges, this protobuf message acknowledges the split-screen request, and the client uses this message to set up its, its internal uh, like split-screen structure and metadata and so on. However, no check on the client is actually, uh, no client on the, 
no check on the client is actually performed if the client actually requested this split screen session in the first place and just executes the handler. And thus the attacking server is able to send this message at any time. Uh, so that's quite funny. And on the right hand side, you see a snippet of the vulnerable code. You can see that the slot index is passed straight up into the array, which also is in the data section. And similar to the previously shown bug, we inside the data section, we get PC control through the virtual call down the chain. There's only one check if the uh, be active field is true, which is just a bool. And so we got uh, execution control. So notice how those two issues gave us the exactly same exploit primitive. So essentially these bugs were very much plug and play with our existing info leak and exploitation infrastructure. And in the following, I'm just going through the exploitation of the split screen, uh, split screen bug as it's almost exactly the same as the entity bug. And so to take advantage of these bugs, we need a way to find some way to place a pointer in controlled memory. As you remember, we used virtual calls, so we need to find a pointer to some controlled memory. Luckily for us, the source engine provides us with just the right primitive, and those are CVARs. CVARs, which are basically a basic key value uh, storage for configuration. If you played CSGO, something like the allowed player size for the game session or the maximum amount of rounds, those are CVARs. And they are fixed named, so they are also into the data section. And up, most importantly, a part of the bidirectional protobuf message, so the server can set and read CVARs to its liking. And they can hold all kinds of data structures, such as strings, floating points, colors, which are encoded as integers. And the game makes no distinction if it's like the maximum number of players, that's obviously in, should be an int, but you all, the server could also send it to a, like a string or something. This has no impact. And further, we use the fact that CVOS also provide us with the abilities to solve controlled word site content as a color, like an int. And we need this later to hold uh, the fake virtual table entry to gain uh, rip control. So, but however, unluckily for us, unlike, uh, unlike um, strings, integer values are first obscured, that's the wording in the source engine, before they are stored. And the comment actually tells us that this was done so it would be harder for cheat engine to find these values in memory. And this could actually prove the tough roadblock for us uh, because we wouldn't have any idea how to uh, bypass the obscuring to get a valid pointer into that. However, because they're in data section and the obscuring is done with the disk pointer, which is known from the leak, we were able to store any value we, we wanted to. And we were able to predict this encoding. So let's have a quick overview of the game plan. So first off, we have the engine DLL, which we leaked earlier. And the first arrow shows the out-of-bound access from the split-screen array to, to controlled memory lying on the heap through the CVAR primitive. So this is the CVAR string object. The second, point, the second arrow points to the heap where our string content is uh, lying. And we use the second CVAR to write a single jump gadget and point the virtual table to in, it in step three. So we point the virtual table to another CVAR, which we point to a job gadget. So thanks of the nature of the virtual call, we will always have at least some registers to play with. And in this case, this pointer is stored in ECX. And while we were developing the exploit, multiple game updates happened, so we had to like exchange our primitive uh, log or job gadgets and grubbed gadgets. And essentially there were two types of uh, gadgets we used. Uh, in a few cases, EBX pointed to the fake object so we could use the uh, line below. But most of the time we had to do a two-step uh, jump gadget, which is basically exchanging the ECX register with EAX, which now points to our controlled string siever, which then jumps back to the second line where we actually perform the pivot. Also important, important to note that we need to pop the first element because this is the pointer to the SIVA object on the, in the engine dealer. So we cannot rob, uh, use that as a robbed gadget. 
So let's see a live uh, expert in action. Maybe let's watch another time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so thanks, Niklas. Um, now let's talk about a bit about the impact. So what is the actual impact of the Spark? Well, we can reliably execute code on the victim's machine. The infoly can be formed multiple times until we are certain that we have all the pointers that we need, and the out-of-bounds issues and the memory corruption are also reliable, assuming the infoleak is valid. So from here on, attackers can basically steal private information, stage malware, or even install crypto miners. It would also be just as easy to send out more Steam invites to all the friends and pawn basically every one of the friends and use the PC as a part of botnet or something like that. Let's also talk a bit about the disclosure timeline because that was also very interesting as well. So we have reported the bug through HackerOne on the 4th of January last year. It was triaged a couple of days later by a HackerOne employee. But then nothing happened for almost three months. And we basically already gave up on getting a bounty and we just hoped that we could publish this research as a blog post or something, at, something like that at some point. Um, but then we noticed that some other people were actually publishing posts about Counter-Strike vulnerabilities on Twitter. And we joined them and also published a video of our exploits. And yeah, then after some days, a couple of news outlets actually colored the vulnerabilities, which then apparently made Valve focus on the HackerOne report. And yeah, we noticed that they were slowly fixing other reports, um, giving us some hope. And then... Eventually, our report was fixed and we received $15,000 as a bounty. So we were quite happy with that. But yeah, sadly, the communication was only through a HackerOne employee and we never got any message from a Valve representative whatsoever, which was quite sad. And yeah, this is now the end of our talk. Um, we hope you had fun and feel free to ask us any questions. You can reach us probably after this talk or um, through Twitter if you want. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Well, Niklas, uh, Simon, and Carl, thank you very much. Uh, that was very interesting. I don't know if any of you guys played Counter-Strike uh, in your youth or whatever, but uh, I was sweating a little. Um, that was very interesting. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'll come around. Uh, just put up your hands, um, and I'll hand you over the microphone. Hi, uh, great talk. Uh, the fixes that uh, Val deployed, did they seem to be like just pinpoint fixing like these very specific issues or did you see any more like systemic uh, overhaul of uh, like the structure or anything that would, or yeah. Yeah, so I don't want to spoil too much, but their patching infrastructure is like, not on par with industry standards because a few days later with like we met with the, oops, sorry we met with the other people who are also researching this uh, game and they were also involved in like team fortress 2 uh, exploitation and one of them actually messaged us later that our info leak wasn't actually patched for team fortress but was patched for csgo so they obviously have like not a unified git and we also heard that uh, like especially entity exploitation that the, they didn't just put in like the assert as a real bounce check, but rather put in like a bounce check that is like covering half the memory space or something. I'm not quite sure about that, but yeah, actually the entity exploitation um, was also previously used by um, other people as well. Like there's obviously lots of paths going into that root cause uh, because it's the entity component system and. So yeah, it's pr pretty much like front door, put on like <laughs> some some easy patch and like ship it. But y yes, it's um, it's probably you can still patch if maybe some some of those issues. Maybe you can uh, still 
still get a remote cause execution, if that answers your question. All right. So I also think that um, memory corruption issues are probably pretty easy to find still. Um, the info leak was definitely the, the, the harder part to break ASLR. That definitely proved uh, to be quite tough. So if anyone has questions in the, the top balcony, just shout down and I'll repeat it for you. If uh, Questions? Yes? No? Maybe? Perfect. I think there's one over there. I'm going to start sweating having to walk up and down this place. How much time did you spend actually searching for all the bugs, especially like the RSLR bug, InfoLeak? Um, I think the whole project from beginning to finish was like roughly two months. Is that right? Yeah, so two months. And we had, I think, three duplicates, if I remember yeah. correctly. So we found, we found a couple of memory corruptions. And with Valve, they want you to provide an exploit. Uh, they don't pay for the actual bug. So um, we actually started sending them bugs, and we asked if it's a duplicate first before we wrote an exploit, just because we didn't know, and writing an exploit is quite, you know, it takes a long time. And for the exploit itself, I would say like two weeks maybe from beginning to end, maybe one and a half. Yeah. Yeah, so the most uh, time was spent on actually doing the networking, and that wasn't part of the exploit, but we still had to like replicate all the prod above. Uh, they have like... They have like two or three levels of fragmentations, uh, which was pretty annoying to <laughs> get all of that right. And that was like one week and probably like the expert in itself, the Rob Chen was probably yeah, a week. But finding the bugs, it was in total uh, probably a two-month project, yeah. Also, the InfoLeak in particular, I think um, we spent probably one day writing the PUC for Linux. And then I was quite unmotivated because I thought they used something else in Windows, so surely it's not going to work. When uh, someone motivated me to just try, and it worked for some reason, the exact same proof of concept without modification, so that saved a lot of time. All right, I think um, if anyone has any questions, last chance. Going once, going twice. Sold. All right. So thank you so much. Uh, the next talk is going to be uh, no passwords, more problems, I believe. Uh, I think that starts at 1450. Um, and thank you so much. A round of applause. <laughs>